What's up, Podheads? Welcome to the Potty of Slave podcast. We're here again, 2023, rocking it out with my fellow man, Anthony and Tony. How are you guys doing today? The singular man. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're one. We, we, one, we one are unit. one. Yep. Three-headed monster, like we used to say. Tony, you answer that first, because I'm going to go, I'm going to answer after you, and my, I mean, my answer will be longer than yours. <laughs> I'm good. Go ahead. <laughs> I am not good. We just talked about this. I lost like two hours worth of like visual uh, editing (laughs) in Photoshop. Well, I haven't lost it necessarily yet, but it's looking like it's going to get lost. I'm not going to say what it is because that'll probably give away when we're uh, recording. Uh, That's a secret, you know. Yeah, you never know. We're in the bunker. We're in the bunker right now. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that sucks, dude. And uh, it's that's comes back to the fact that. And we've said this to you guys many a time. It's just the three of us. <laughs> and the fact that uh, we, we do all the editing and make all the visuals and do all the posts and talk, you know, for an hour, hour and a half once a week or, or more, depending on what we have. It's, it's a grind out here for you boys. So um, thank a podcaster if you see them. Hey, I love that. Thank a podcaster. And you know what? Thank us while you're at it. Yeah, thank us. <laughs> Tip us. <laughs> do you guys identify as podcasters? I don't. I don't. Nope. Yep. No. And that, that's, that's a theme from other podcasts that I've listened to, they, it's like, no, podcaster. I'm not a podcaster. I mean, we are. I mean, <laughs> this is what, episode 149. It's not like, I, I think at this point we are podcasters, but uh, do I identify as one? No, I'm a lot of other things first. And then podcaster, yeah, we do it. It's fun. But I'm not sure I identify as one. Yeah, we don't have our uh, collectible baseball cards for a podcaster quite yet, so I think I'll hold off on that. <laughs> Collectibles, <title>. Nate. Jeez. <laughs> oh, what, what a dropping segue. Hints. Dropping hints. Hey, before we formally segue, I just shit on myself. I'm going to pat myself on the back. Last week, I said this year is the year of Long Island. And between when we recorded that and when you're listening right, right now, Silent Majority announced a reunion, first show in what, seven years in Brooklyn at the uh, Brooklyn Monarch, April 15th. I didn't call it, but I kind of put it out into the you world. You kind of called it. Who's next? Silent Majority were your exact words, I believe, in from last John. week's episode. Yeah, so with that show was with Koyo, right, Twan? And you're going. That's right. I, I, I failed to mention that. I, I do have a ticket. I'm scoping out hotels. I got my transportation. I'm, I'm ready to roll. Let's, let's do this. Never seen him. Uh, I think in the last 20 years, they, maybe 15 years, they played twice, so... This will be the third time. Yeah, I think this is the first show in seven years is what I saw. Yeah, first show seven years. And then before that was, I think, in the 2000s. So I'm in. Hopefully I can get Life of a Spectator. I I had a chance to get it when they did the reissue, but I just didn't pull the trigger. So maybe they'll have like a reunion press or something. Oh, that'd be really cool. I'll scoop that up. My hope is that that's done already, right? Yeah. So uh, the other thing with that is, and it it does kind of tie into our, our theme tonight, you have to, if you're going to announce that show and you're going to have like, hey, we have a live show, we're going to have some pressings of the record that maybe haven't seen a pressing in a long time, you have to have that all planned well in advance. So that, that kind of feeds into our topic tonight. Nate, what are we talking about tonight, man? Tonight is kind of a three-prong approach on looking forward into the future. This was inspired by... Things like the JRE, the J. Ro- Joe Rogan podcast, and the people that he has on to basically not predict the future, but talk about why things are the way they are and a little bit more insight on the, you know, where they're going. Given we're a music specific podcast, you know, I think all of us are pretty intelligent. And, and Tuan, I mean, both of you guys have made predictions and they've come true. So that's, that's, you know, proof in the pudding right there. But this one is a three prong approach again with three different buckets. Where in 10 years are music venues going? AI, specifically in regards to writing, given uh, some of the current events in that regard. And then thirdly, uh, collectibles. Where are they going in 10 years? What's the future of collectibles in specific to music collecting? When you mentioned that, I was thinking collectibles, merch, commerce, yep. e-commerce, any, anything in that world. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And maybe we'll do some... Uh... Some kind of on the spot stuff, you know, just in if there's anything that comes up outside of those three in terms of where things are going to go in 10 years, we have a prediction or thoughts, throw it out there. I would say that there'll be some tangents on this episode, but I would, I would be surprised if we didn't just kind of take a topic and run with it. So uh, which one do we want to start with? Spin the wheel, baby. 
Oh man, I don't have the wheel set up. Uh, tick, 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 AI. All right, we're gonna start with AI. AI. Ooh. Right out of the gate. I got a thoughts. I mean, we while you were in Japan, Nate, we talked about doing it in real time, surrounding these like up and coming music services with just AI driven songs. There's no people, I say in quotation marks, making them. There are computers. Uh, that's I'm scared of that. I mean, has nobody seen the fucking Matrix? <laughs> like, Exactly. What are we doing here? Uh, and the other thing is, like, the reason we like music, I, I would say, for me, the reason that I like music, one of the many reasons I like music, is because we get someone's story. We get a song that relates to a feeling. There may be ways for a computer to, to give me some of that, but it's not genuine. Like, you don't get the, the real, Nate always says, the heartfelt, like, the, these songs are coming from the heart type of thing. You're not going to get that from, uh, you know, some computer just jotting down what it's heard before and giving it back to you in a different form. Yeah, you, uh, you echo my thoughts almost verbatim. There will be pockets where this will work. It'll 100% work. But any genre of music where the audience values any ounce of authenticity, it will not work. So the pockets that it will work, Top 40, Radio, Sirius. I mean, most of the listeners of those, one, don't even know who the artist is that they're listening to, and two, don't care to know, and they don't give a shit. You know, they're not looking through liner notes. They're not looking to see. Most music fans don't go to concerts. And with this world, like, unless you're going to do like a gorillas thing, which, <laughs> you know, actually, how did Millie Vanilli turn out? You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> yeah. any, anything where there's, where the fans value like an ounce of, like, imagine a hardcore, uh, a virtual hardcore band. I'd be like, what the fuck is that? Get that out of, get out of here. Yeah. They'd have trouble with the authenticity aspect of that, right? Yeah, but there, um, I, again, I'm sure this will come up in this conversation, but AI is taking over, right? Chat GPT is the hottest thing. I mean, I've put in, me personally, write a blank, blank, blank verse in the style of Drake, and it pops it out, and newsflash, it's almost as good as Drake. So, you know. That's amazing, and probably, yeah. But you're right, it's the pop music thing, right? And he is, for all intents and purposes, a pop musician. He's a, he's a rapper, but and good, don't get me wrong, but... Uh, that is a formulaic. It, I, I go back to like Beyonce. You you see that like this is this was written by one person. Here's Beyonce's song that was written by seventy five people. It's that right. This is just going to be. It's written by seventy five computers versus seventy five people. And the people who will benefit from this and want to benefit from this are the people in the that are making all the money off it. They don't have to pay any of it out. That's actually that was going to be a point I made that the adoption is is guaranteed because of. You know, the immediate ROI, it's there, it's proven, the AI is pumping it out based on likely what words that are trending, subjects that are topical, anything in that bucket. So, and it's AI, right? It's already ahead of us anyway. And it's just capturing so many data points faster than anyone could write on a notepad. And looking even further than that, one thing given, you say Drake, where is, it, where is the line going to be drawn where Drake himself is is utilizing chat GBT, but he's still getting credits because he's kind of feeding it ideas. Is there, there's got to be a line drawn there. It already exists, man. That he's had ghostwriters for years. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think it already exists. And there's, I don't know if you've seen like the TikToks, there's, there's TikToks where guys will do what I just did, what I just said I did, they get the lyrics. They have basically a AI generated beat, put it all in, I don't know, Pro Tools, Audacity, whatever. And they pitch vocals in Drake's style, and it sounds like Drake. Totally. You know, he, the guy made it look like it only took him a, a minute, because that's all the TikTok was. Who knows how long it took. And, but this is probably just some Joe Schmo. He can do this. You know, this is mm -hmm. it's definitely where it's going in Top 40 radio all day. Because at that point, you just have to pay data engineers and developer salary and not fucking Beyonce. That's so true. You're not paying out any of the stream money to whoever because the music was made by no one. Nothing in perpetuity yeah, at all. Exactly. It's, it's, it's here's your salary, and once the once the brain is made, it just fucking learns itself. You know what I mean? Until Keanu takes it down, right? Because <laughs> that's, that's what right. we're gonna need. We're gonna need the one. Well, there is one stipulation here, which actually I just thought of on the spot because of the, you know the background that you provided. 
is anyone that's selling their rights to the music. So let's use Bruce Springsteen, for instance. If the AI learns Bruce Springsteen, his style of writing, he sells the rights to the music, and then they're feeding the AI that backlog of information basically fed right into the system. Hey, and let's say, and God forbid this doesn't happen anytime soon, but he dies, but he can still make music because now he's an AI version of Bruce Springsteen, call it Neuralink. Wow, that's lives, lives forever. Now mind those, blown. Wow, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Rights the rights of the music have already been sold, so now it's an entity owned by whoever. Let's call it Apple owns Bruce Springsteen's rights at this point, his masters, and now it's continuing to write. It's basically the 2.0 version of the Tupac hologram at, at Coachella, but now you're getting new music too. Which you know, there's always been rumors that Tupac's still alive, right? So, well, and then the hologram can tour. They can charge an arm and a leg, and the hologram isn't going to be upset or, or or be shamed into like Bruce was charging way too much money for his his uh, concerts here coming up because they're not a person. It's a hologram of someone who maybe has passed on. So like Whitney Houston per se, you know, she's out there as a hologram, or Tupac out there as a hologram. You get to go on a twelve date tour across the biggest country, biggest cities in America. And you get to see Tupac doing Tupac music. Maybe it's new Tupac music sounds just like him, but it's not really because obviously we know what has happened. But yeah, Nate, that's where it's headed, man. Fuck. Nate, that I didn't think of that. And the industry probably hasn't thought of that. So, you know, tip your bartender, Mr. Nate. Uh, we gave away so many secrets on here. So many ideas. Just got it. Yeah, we got IP, but we just kind of give it away for free. We're open source at the Potty Slate podcast. Well, hey, t- trademark or just any of the any and all ideas you hear from the Patio Slate podcast tonight, or if we ever change our name down the line, whatever we have changed our name to, they're ours first. So pay us out. <laughs> hey, do, do you guys know the uh, rapper Effin Mecca? So F N two letters, and then Mecca M E K A. Negative. No, that's the virtual rapper that Capitol Records signed. Signed him to what? How? With what? <laughs> <laughs> it reads like a hard times headline. That is very real. In Jesus. fact, I did a little digging and prep for this. Uh, this comes from, I'm not sure where I saw this, but uh, I'll read this to you. AI powered rapper Effin Mecca signed a record deal with Capitol Records, becoming the first digital artist to sign with a major label. Try not to laugh here. 11 days later, the deal was terminated. Amidst calls that the character promoted gross stereotypes of black culture. <laughs> I mean, you can't make that wow. up. That's... And, and you know what? Good. Well, this is one of those situations. I'm glad FM Echo was canceled. Fuck him. 100%. Absolutely. That, we can all get behind that. But that, and that's the thing is these, you know, the AI tech and the algorithms, it's going to get so smart that it's going to have a mind of its own. I have a, I have a question for you regarding FM Mecca. Did he pick his own name? Probably not. I right? don't I mean, know. They probably came, some idiot in, in a boardroom or idiots in a boardroom came up with his name, probably, my guess. If you're that one of those idiots, I'm sorry, but hey, we could do better. We could have done better than F and Mecca. There are so many clever names out there. It's AI generated, like throw one in the chat GPT and see if it gives you a better name than F and Mecca. <laughs> That's a good question. Is it sentient? Like, did it come with its own name? Well, not really. I mean, we didn't choose our names, right? So someone's at the core is giving you a name you know, as you're born, but AI is a whole different animal. But I wonder if it's sentient. It's like, no, actually, I'm formally known as Prince, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a symbol now. Exactly. You can't make this up, guys. This is where, it's not even where we're headed. That's where we are. But can you imagine in 10 years? <sighs> or, I mean, we're trying to imagine it now, but it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. Yeah, the 10-year benchmark, the reason I put that in here is kind of a, I don't know, something to pull from was I saw some article recently where they had highlighted every major company that we utilize today in the last 10 years. Like they didn't exist at all. And now it's like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, like all these companies that we utilize every day. In fact, we're kind of destined to use these where, I don't know, I don't want to say dependent on them, but we definitely utilize them very regular. So in 10 years, are these going to be you know, eclipsed by Brand new technology. I think Chat GBT is definitely an example of where, where it's going or where it is today and where it could go. So, listeners, let us know what we missed. Let us know what you think. Uh, we love this stuff. We, we actually probably could do a whole episode on that topic, but I think we'll sure. cap it there with that one. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, I, one last question for you guys. If uh, an artist that you never got to see, a la Tupac, 
were to come to say the State Theater as a hologram and played, you know, his hits, would you go? Would you pay 20 bucks to see that or 100 bucks to see that? I mean, here's something real. real. I mean, I've, I've never looked up Tupac live in my life on YouTube. So I've gone this long. I think I'll probably just stick to this, listening to his existing catalog. Yeah, I've never thought about it. You know, I did see his hologram performance at Coachella on YouTube, but that was enough. That was almost like, all right, well, I'm not going to pay for it. But when you say 20 bucks, I don't know. It might, you know, it might be an experience. Well, maybe, maybe say it's not Tupac. <laughs> say it's somebody that you really, really wanted to see and it just didn't happen. Yeah. I could see myself, depending on the artists, going to it. Because at that point, it's like a tribute light show experience you know what i mean it's a yeah, good mm-hmm. point it's a yep. it's a yeah it's that type of thing at that point light show experience is a great parallel like the pink floyd light show experience it's as good as it's going to get because it's never going to happen again so right good point that's a good call I, it would be artist dependent for me too uh, answering my own my own prompt here but i would pay 20 bucks to see tupac at the state theater <laughs> if it was you know a light show and we had nothing else going on that night yeah hell yeah all right let's move on so you pick. We've got, let's go with venues. What do venues look like in the future, in the fairly near future, 10 years from now, in the year 2033? Quick, quick off the bat question. Will there be more or less venues in 10 years? Less. I had this in my notes, and I, I had a note that did say mass consolidation, so yes, less. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think there'll be, there'll be more live nation venues than there are now they'll be less independent but i don't think the the new will outpace those that close because i think you've always said this <laughs> the middle class is shrinking now it it might not exist and what comes with that is those venues completely agree i think you're gonna see and it kind of goes hand in hand with this ai generated artists you're gonna see those venues get gobbled, either get gobbled up if they're good venues and they do well, or fall by the wayside because they get priced out to get any of these things, musicians or whatever, into the door. So we're going to see less venues overall and more, you know, kind of major label owned uh, venues, whether it be Lab Nation or Apple or whoever. Yeah, exactly. And I think it extends further than that because you think about you know, just any iconic venue like we'd love to go to. CBGB's is a great example. It closed. They actually shifted the building and now it's like a, you know, tourist attraction. I think that's going to become the future too. There's going to be some venues that kind of retain its ethos and kind of like structural integrity as basically just something you can visit and may play into like a metaverse type venue as well, where like, hey, you can go visit, you know, the Roxy in LA and check it out. But will they have shows? Not really, because the liability would the way the place is built just is not going to sustain given where things are going and the capacity of the people that want to go to the show there anyway. So it'll be like a virtual experience and they'll retain it for that reason, that reason only. And like you said, it'll likely be owned by someone like uh, Live Nation that has the money to keep it afloat without it going to the wayside. Do I, a quick question for you guys, just riffing off of that, Nate. Say CBGBs. You get to go to CBGBs. It's a museum as you're kind of purporting it now, right? It's, it's still there. Shows don't happen, whatever. You put on, you walk in, you put on a virtual headset and you're transported back to seeing the Ramones or, or that tool show that Ian Robinson told us about <laughs> on episode 27. You're just, it's, and it's really close to real because we're going to get better. That stuff's going to get better, right? It's not going to be where it is today where it's pretty cool now. Feels like you're kind of there, but not really. You put one on, you're elbow to elbow with somebody. You can feel that they're right there. You know, like that's going to change. Those senses are going to kind of probably come into play with that stuff, I think. I, would, I think I would go to that. Do they pump in the, the piss smell in the stinky bathroom? Oh, I no, hope every, not. Everything. But maybe. Everything. <laughs> Puke. I, yeah. I think that joke's been made on this podcast. Probably, yeah. Puke or weed or any of that stuff, yeah. I mean, I'd try it. Like, there's no part of me that's like, no way, I won't try that. But I'm not like get me there but again in 10 years when maybe there's not an alternative you know i'm open to it i think i'm open to it yeah it's that or bust because it's the only reason it's going to stay in in play otherwise there's no there's no reason to keep it you know and it's it's sad but it's the ultimate reality is like why is this building that barely makes safety code gonna stay as a music venue when a the capacity doesn't even pay in spades anymore and c like it's just a relic at that point you know 
What happened to B? How did we skip B? <laughs> well, B? well, B, I think, is probably where you're going, which is a lot of these iconic venues are in high real estate markets, and the opportunity exactly. cost is fucking through the roof. You can try to maintain a failing venue, or the next real estate ven- uh, developer is going to throw condos, you know, condo money at you. Exactly. I, exactly. I think that's going to happen. It's a, that is B. <laughs> that's yeah, that's that is B. B happened in Seattle with the Showbox, um, which is like the theater type venue in Seattle. It hasn't been torn down yet, but yeah, there's plans to tear it down and put condos there. Uh, happened in West Hollywood with the House of Blues. They tore it down. They're putting condos there. Same with Amoeba Music with uh, our former guest. Our former guest, Mark Weinstein. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it sucks, but we see the writing on the wall. So it's actually more imperative to go to these shows as much as possible while we, while we can in these, in these venues. Well, we see the writing on the wall, and it's through an AI headset in a, in a white <laughs> room. That's where we're going. <laughs> That's exactly where we're headed. Yeah, I, I, I think we're all on the same page. Like the, the top is super insulated, and the bottom, I don't see – I mean, are VFW halls going away? Lions clubs going away? Like any of these hall shows – People will find a place for those. I'm not worried about that. Someone's fucking basement. If it come down to it, basement shows make a big comeback. So I think the top's insulated, the bottom's insulated. The other thing that I was thinking about is Live Nation, they'll grow in venue size. I think they'll grow in number of venues, but they're going to grow in prestige as well. The experience at the top is going to be through the fucking roof in 10 years. They're going to make nosebleed seats enjoyable such that you're willing to spend the premium because that it's all going premium nosebleed seats will be 500 the view from your seat sucks hey no problem here's a jumbotron here's in seat screens you know from multiple angles you know you don't want to leave your seat to fucking wait in line to get a beer well up oh, every every section has waiter waitress accommodations Want to meet the band? No problem. Dish out yeah. your wallet. Mm-hmm. It's going to be on demand. It's going to be... And actually, Nate, you sent a, a video or photo of some state-of-the-art venue out in California. The YouTube one or something? Uh, SoFi Stadium and YouTube Theater. They're connected, but YouTube, yeah, yeah, both. That mm-hmm. looked futuristic. I think that's where it's going. That's actually... When you were describing that's exactly where I was going to jump in because it is such a great snapshot of where it's going, especially the fact that it's in Inglewood, which is kind of a rough area, but you have this spaceship looking venue that's paving the way for that type of venue going forward. And I had nosebleed, you know, speaking of nosebleed seats for the Chili Pepper show, but the experience of being in that, I mean, you felt like you were transported 10 years in the future. And it was cool just for that, even though I'm, you know, we're all kind of, you know, hanging on for dear life with, you know, brick and mortar and wood and uh, metal. But at the end of the day, like it's, we we're kind of like in this weird hybrid, like we're lucky that we grew up when we did because we, We've always been kind of one foot in both sides. So I think it's going that way for sure. I think the money's there. It's just inevitable. It's a, it's a really bizarre thing. And you said something about the VIP experience. I think there's going to be, especially with venues like that, there's going to be almost like a brewery type tour where it's not like, oh, it'd be cool to go backstage or know someone that has a backstage pass. That'll be another upgrade where you're kind of being, you're going backstage with like this tour guided and you're watching it. You know, you're not being, you're not, you can't shake hands or anything. All, but you can, all you of can, that. You mm-hmm. walk right through, you know, yep. this is what it's like behind the scenes as an upgrade. Well, that's, that's that, as Tuan said, that kind of elevation of the, maybe the shitty seats you're in, but at the same time, you're getting all of these things for the, the money that you're going to spend and could kind of feed into you're throwing on a virtual headset from your nosebleed seats at SoFi that gets you backstage, you watch, you watch the band get together and do their little huddle before they go on stage, right? Because you get that extra access because you paid for it with whatever they end up having for, uh, you know, innovations in that, in that space. I can totally see all of that. I'm not sure. And we've kind of, some of this feels a little doom and gloom, but I think in this case, that's pretty fucking awesome. Like that makes going to a show in a massive venue a little more palatable because you're going to get way more. Maybe you're paying for it, but you're not just sitting there saying, oh, man, I got to go all the way down to go to the bathroom or all the way down to get a beer, and it's going to take 20 minutes. I'm going to miss half the set. Like, I don't want to do that. Now you don't have to do that. Like, that's those things are good. We want those things to innovate. I know. I, although I don't see any world where, like, I'm pleased to dish out 300 for nosebleed, but I think that's where it's going. Yeah. 
I, the one thing that I was thinking about when you were just talking is in 10 years, there will be venues where the venue itself rotates, rotates such that, you know, cause state, they have like a rotating stage, you know, band in the, in the round, whatever. I think there's going to be like venues that, that rotate and that move that, you know, everyone gets an equal view by the end of the show. I don't know how they'll do it, but some crazy shit like that's probably going to happen. Yeah, I I think you're right, and you're you're saying like, say you're in the nosebleeds to start, but you aren't going to be in the nosebleeds the whole time. Like things move so that you get front row for a hot minute. So they can charge a thousand bucks for everyone Every in the seat. fucking building. Yeah. Yep, good call. It's going to happen. Some you're weird right. shit like that, or the stage like it reminds me of like a Disney ride in my head. You totally, know? that's definitely happening. You're absolutely right. It's definitely happening. I can tell you how it's going to happen. Ooh, 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 yeah. ooh. All right, folks, if you're listening, go grab. Clear out. <laughs> Clear out for Nate. He's going ISO right now. There's 10 seconds left in the shot clock. Let's go. All right. So you're all on the same application. You're registering, hey, I need to take a piss. So you're, you have to move no matter what. So your spot is just dead space. So you're trading spots with someone based on something you need to do anyway. So you're basically teleporting to the front rail watching the show literally front row from the nosebleed but you're doing it in place of someone that is in that spot so in terms of like let's call it fire code the capacity the spread of the people everything is still intact you're just really kind of just trading off and maybe it's even a trade-off that you're paying for with a fellow fan like fan to fan like hey i'm front row dude i got a jet so you can take my spot for 60 bucks just take it master venmo me right now the tech exists even now for that no one's yeah. thought of it that's right good point wow nate Hey, I only wanted to see the opener. Yeah. I'm bailing and I might still, I might make money on this front row ticket. That's true. Yeah. Or yeah, you only want to see the opener because maybe you're friends with them, which I've done twice this year, or I guess last <laughs> year in 2022, where I'm, I like stuck around for some of the extra stuff, but I went because I wanted to see our boys in Troll. And hey, I have this ticket and the show was really well sold. Do you want to come in? Like transferableness of the tickets and of the seats. Or if you're in venue and you want to, you know what? I'm not digging this. I, I got to get up in the morning. You want my seat up top? Come on down. Pay me whatever. Every concert will have like a, a digital forum or a digital message board, you know, where you can barter. I'm surprised that Live Nation Ticketmaster hasn't figured that out because they would whack you on the way in and whack you on the way out like they do with everything else. <laughs> well, yeah. we always make the joke. When the new music comes, you go take a pass. So I'll be like, all right, you know, I'm going to see you two at the garden or whatever some new music they're like hey we're gonna play two new ones i'll rent out my seat for two songs for 100 bucks i think we're on to something guys i think we're on to many things it's stolen it's stolen the idea hasn't even this this hasn't even hit the airwaves yet and that idea is being <laughs> stolen because <laughs> they're fucking listening to us right now zuckerberg is listening <laughs> yes he is my iphone's right by the imac here so i mean like you said twine when you think about things that are you know, adopting and, you know, active right now, you think of things like a POS system toast, you pay your tab, you get your food, there's no waiting in line. If all that stuff's done proactively, you know how many beers you're going to want, you have it on order, you know, as before you even get there, when you buy your ticket, yeah, I'm going to want two beers, I'm probably going to want one in 730 and maybe 1030. So you kind of everything's pre ordered. So the money's already advanced, right? And that goes that plays right into that piss break and everything, everything's timed out. And if you're missing that, you know, call it time slot, you upgrade it in real time. Drink. In seat catheters. How about that? Yeah, you never oh have to get up to piss. <laughs> you could pay a fan to piss for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the full experience. Oh, man. Two shakes. Any more than that. And <laughs> you're just playing with it. <laughs> Speaking of playing with it, this is Nate's transition. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> All right, the last one we were going to hit was collectibles in music or merch or, you know, any kind of tangible good, right? Yep. Yes. Where is this going to be in 10 years is the question. So it's already, and I think with obviously the internet has helped for vinyl, for sites like Discogs, places, marketplaces, eBay, et cetera. You kind of know what you have with just about everything nowadays. Price wise, right? Especially as the pandemic kind of kicked into high gear, everybody and their brother decided they were going to do sports cards or do vinyl or whatever. And 
it, you're not going to, gone are the days are you going to roll into a record store, find a used record from somebody's collection that maybe you pick up for $8 and bring home and find out it's worth 100 Those days are gone. They don't happen Gonzo. anymore. See yeah. ya. I miss you. Yeah, same. So how do these, how does this get worse for us? Obviously, supply and demand is not great. Getting your hands on, say, vinyl is not easy nowadays for whether it's the artist trying to press for their new record or us getting our hands on limited edition things that come out and are sold out the second that they go on sale because that happens a lot too. So I think this only gets harder and harder. The scarcity, uh, we, we made, instead of making 1,000 copies or 500 copies, we're making 25 copies and it's pay what you can or they, the number goes up as they disappear. You know what I mean? Like we're, they're just going to keep, putting their hand in this is dour but they're going to keep putting their hands in our pockets on this stuff it's not going to get better it's going to get worse i think what, what, what's the what's the concept it's like the dutch auction it's like the price they start at super high price reduces until there's a buyer like mm, yep. bands could do that labels could do that and depending on the band they would probably make they mean they would make more money on less quantity and volume yeah i mean i have something that plays right into this and it's a different take on it but it's the result is very much the same. And it's the environmental implications of making vinyl because it comes from you know, petroleum. So making pressing wax is going to become controversial in the next 10 years, kind of like cobalt Ooh. is for smartphones yeah. and rechargeable batteries is today, or at least most recently, it just came out recently about how they're mining for cobalt in Africa. And it's, you know, basically slave trade. So petroleum, you know, we're going full electric here in California. Uh, it's going to be rolling across the country and parts of the world to go full electric. So gasoline, petroleum is just, you know, it's, it's out. But vinyl's in, has been in, and it's obviously a throwback, but it's something we all really enjoy. But I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the environmental implications, both on the wax, the paper to make the sleeves, the whole thing is just going to be, you know, a finger pointing contest on like, hey, I thought you were an environmental band, you two keep using you too, but you're pressing all this vinyl, so clearly you don't care. And it's like, well, we do care, but you're right. We're going to press five instead of 5,000 for that reason alone and just make it a really prized possession. Or one, like the Wu-Tang Clan, when they put that record out. Yeah. So not, not only will the music be recycled, but the actual materials will have to be recycled. I'm, I'm okay with that. Maybe they find a way to, to turn have vinyl be vinyl but not i'm saying in, in quotation marks it becomes something that's still playable on all those record players but isn't made from the same stuff or is more re renewable maybe that happens in the next 10 years hey straws got banned that's all i gotta say if straws got banned anything's possible and then they were replaced by plastic lids that are more have more plastic yeah are worse and paper straws suck too so maybe paper vinyl will suck <laughs> paper. you know that's i mean nate that's that's you clearing the lane and ISO in this, you know, with, with, with a bit of a hot take, because I wouldn't have thought of that. This is why the three of us work, because, <sighs> Anthony, you and I often have similar ideas. Nate, I love his ideas because they're not the way I think about the world, and I had not thought of that. And he's absolutely right in the world's resources are not getting um, – they're, they're finite, right? We only have so many things. So uh, having uh, – needing to get your hands on one of 5,000 copies of a uh, repress of a record – becomes one in 50 because there's just less stuff and, it, and the price goes up. The other thing that it, this, this isn't like direct to merch, but it ties into it. And it's a concept that exists now and we've talked about it, but I think this is truly where it's going is subscription model by band. sixty nine ninety nine Pearl Jam subscription. You get the music, you get early access to merch. It's, you know, it's your ticket into the Pearl Jam world. It's, it, it, you know, advanced tickets, all that stuff. And obviously Patreon exists now, but I think that will be the norm and not the exception. It's funny you say Pearl Jam because they've kind of been doing that with the 10 Club for they did. Yeah, quite they have, some yeah. time. Yeah, but it'll be more. You're right. It'll be, uh, if you want any of our stuff, you have to be subscribed to said band. So I, didn't, I agree I didn't with know you. That. I, yeah. I knew that. I knew, I didn't think of that. I knew they had a, a club like that, but I didn't think of that. It's where I ripped the show. Nate, the, Nate and I went and saw them in 05, Nate, in Boston, yep. I think, for, yeah, uh, nice. for self-titled for Avocado. And I found that show online back in my alleged uh, downloading days. And <laughs> I remember Rob bought his condo, friend of the pod, Rob, who's been on a bunch of times with us. He bought his condo, and I 
because he went to the show with us, burned it for him and gave it to him as a housewarming gift. Because I was scouring the internet trying to find the show we were at, and I found it. Ten Club. Yeah, you're right. I think the direct-to-consumer model has been proven to an extent with fan clubs, which have been around since the 70s for the most part. But, you know, that model on steroids, especially if they're independent, because there's really no breach of contract there, because it's, hey, this is our fan base. We're the farmer. They're buying our fruit, you know. So it's a fair trade. In fact, the prices may be a little bit more acceptable because there's no middleman, right? You can really give the people what they want at a price that's reasonable instead of having a cut, a very large cut being taken out over the, you know, off the top. So if there was, if there was ever a band to be the first to do that and not in 10 years, like now would be Slipknot, right? They're out totally. of the contract. The whole not fest infrastructure is way bigger than most people acknowledge or realize, you know, so they have a full camp there. You take away the fact that they need to pay the label first. This subscription model is fucking ripe for them. And it makes having nine band members and extra, <laughs> whatever, a little more palatable because there's not money. <laughs> All the money goes directly back to, you know, the band. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. In fact, to ante up even more on this one, Twan on this bet, I think there's going to be a level up on top of that, which is made to order fan. Like, I want this. I want you know, a painting drawn by Corey Taylor, I'll pay, you know, 20 G's for it. And that's one of one. And you, you get that opportunity. There's call it five slots for the year. Things like that will be implemented. So I guess in this model, what happens, and we've, we've been belaboring this point, but what happens to the up and comers? Again, it's going to be supply and demand with fans. You know what I mean? Like if you're a small band and we, I mean, for the most part, you can go on Spotify and see how many fans a band has the small guy you know if you can't get people to listen to your music you ain't getting them to sign up for a subscription you know what i mean exactly. i think it's it, it would be another barrier to entry because you couldn't capitalize on that model so you're not making money in touring you're not making money in the music you can't pivot to subscription because no one gives a shit you're you're stuck in your garage basically and that sucks man like that sucks for all of us because we, we lose out on some really talented people that way, I think, because their voices don't even have a chance of getting amplified. It's not even that they're not getting amplified, because they're not now, but we don't have a chance for them to, to break through and get a song on a playlist, and then a bunch of people hear them, and then you end up talking to them, because that's what's happened to us a couple of times. So it, it bums me out. That piece of it bums me out, and I do think we're headed there, which sucks. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it, it holds back potential artist and artistry because the return is just so dismal in fact the probability of success in today's world or let's call it 1990 the probability of succeeding as a band in 1990 was dismal but there was a chance and the labels were willing to sign you if you had something good going on now it's like you're against legacy and like you said a sea of people that are all kind of striving for the same thing and getting lost in the mix so yeah, it's 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 it seems bleak and we're not even in that world completely although we talk to those folks all the time well, we are. We are in that world. We're just in that world in a different way because we're content creating. I mean, we, I know we don't identify as podcasters, but <laughs> we do put out an episode of us talking about music once a week. And sometimes what we put out doesn't get heard by people because it doesn't get amplified the way it could, like other things do. Like we're coming off a, a really good episode a couple of weeks ago with uh, Brian McTurn talking about Thrice, one of our biggest episodes to date because the, the content was really good. But we do that every week. We sound that good every week, I think, but not everybody gets to hear it because they're not necessarily getting or not necessarily getting amplified. And more and more artists are also not going to get amplified because of that. You guys are spot on. It will get worse. It'll definitely get worse. So, and we've seen this in a couple of different ways, depending on the size of the band. And we've seen it in our world, the podcast world. Are we going to see more collectives of those smaller artists get together, put together their label, as we call it, and just so they can amplify each other's voices a little more? Are we going to see more of that than we see now? Short answer, yes. Yeah. Anywhere. Again, we just said, like, even the quote unquote successful musicians, you know, depends on how you define success, aren't really successful, maybe monetarily. I think anything that'll provide economies of scale you'll be forced to 
if 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 that's your goal, if that is your goal to be amplified, because some bands, you know, they want to stay local, they want to stay, you know. But if you're if you want to make a go at it, I think you'll see more of it. I agree. I think it's yeah, it's going to become a, a a team effort to to make any kind of progress because it's just going to be so competitive slash it's just you know it's the wild west out there there's just too much going on everyone's grabbing for your attention so the chances of even coming through at all they're just that's just so low so yeah i think i think that's pretty accurate where are you at tone with that i think it's gonna happen more yeah i think it happens some now i think it happens more in our world on the podcasting side of things than it maybe does in the musician's world because I think you, you, you're a musician, you put out music, whether it be as a solo actor or with a band, and you just are kind of trying to get a foothold somewhere, whether it be playing shows, opening for somebody, going out on tour, opening for somebody, or you know, promoting the hell out of your, your um, band or uh, music on social media, on a million different social media platforms. But you should be grabbing a hold of other people and trying to help them to put that out there. And it happens a lot in the podcast world. If you go on podcast Twitter, it's crazy. There's so many podcasts out there, so many different people trying to big up other people. We love it. We do it with some of our friends, but I, I fear it becomes an echo chamber with us. I don't think it will with music because I, what's it hurt to toss on a three minute song? It's a lot harder to toss on an hour conversation. So I think we'll see more of it. And I'm kind of surprised it doesn't happen more now. Yeah, I think I mean, the closest thing to it now, obviously, is a label, right? And it's it's like, you know, like bands signing on the similar label or, you know, an owner of a label going there. But this is, in this, it's generated by the artists, right? By the band. It's intentional band to band. Yeah, definitely. I, I, honestly, I think it's kind of where my head went when Fireworks announced this funeral plant collective, you know what exactly. I mean? Yep. Who knows who else will be under that umbrella, but that's it feels like that's might might be where that is what that is. Well, and the Hotelier did it a couple of years ago, and they re-released or released some vinyl they had kind of kicking around some of their first record, and then some seven inches. I bought them when that happened, and nice. then it kind of disappeared. And I think Brand New was doing it before all the the stuff that happened with them went down with Procrastinate Music Traders, uh, and then that obviously had kind of fizzled out with what happened with the band. So with with Jesse and and his misgivings. So uh, it was happening. I think bands saw it coming, a few of them, but other things got in the way, you know, but, you know, whether it be doing something you shouldn't or maybe just not wanting to do the music thing anymore, which feels like that with the Hotelier. Yeah, I think it'll be implemented more so. And the foundation of it will probably be something like an exclusivity type contract where, hey, you're with us and only with us. And we get rev share based on that because, hey, you're part of our club now. It's like labels 2.0, but it's a little bit more grounded in in terms of what the fans want to see like oh it's cool he's friends with that band i'll check it out it's a a kind of a genuine handoff i could see that happening for sure more so i get get a few things to hit you guys with nice we've talked themes we did the ai we did the venues let's talk specific bands and i have five that will hit let's, let's cap it to a minute you know so kind of a quick hitter so these are specific bands 311 in 10 years, they'll be in their early 60s. Will they still be making music and touring? Just touring or not be a band? Touring, but less. Just touring, you're saying? Yes. Yeah, that's where my head went too. It's touring and probably more of what they're already capitalizing on, which is cruise ships, 311 day, things that are extremely specific and you know experience oriented. And actually, they've done a lot of branding too. So I could see them continuing that legacy on their partnership with a, a brewery and uh, they do cannabis products too. And their merch line obviously is very strong. So I think they're leaning towards that. Cause I mean, they were, they were tour Titans forever. So given how long they've been doing it, I could see the touring kind of being like their main thing. And even that very specific to certain events. Agreed. That's where I'm at. I think it's just touring and the catalog's so big that they can cater it to songs that, won't strain them physically, vocally, all that. Totally. Yep. You know, they'll be the jam band in 2033. Next on the list, Turnstile. I'm pretty sure those dudes are early to mid 30s. So they'll be early to mid 40s. They will have been in the game for 23 years. Still making music and touring, just touring, or call it, call it quits. 
It's a great question because that band right now, especially looking at their live show, which Naked to see at Dia de los Deftones, but in a smaller venues is wild. Does that continue to happen? Probably not. But do they continue to play shows? Yeah, the fan base right now wants everything they can get from them. So I think 10 years, is, they're, still, they're still doing all three, making music, touring, the whole, the whole nine yards. I agree. I think the versatility is there for them to grow and even kind of mellow out maybe over time. I think they have you know, that musicianship to be able to kind of progress into a different band. I mean, they've already done it, right? So I can see that kind of trajectory going in a direction where, hey, we're older now, so we're making this style of music. Not for any reason to conform to, you know, whatever trend is just where we're at today. And I think a great example, we talked about Pearl Jam earlier, like they've done that, you know. If you had asked me in 1993 if I thought Eddie Vedder was going to make like a ukulele album, I would have said, fuck that. But he has, (laughs) and it's great, you know. So (laughs) he's older, you know, it makes sense. So I think they'll either be still making music and touring or they'll be done. I don't, I see no world with it, just touring. Next on the list, Newfound Glory. They'll be in their early to mid 50s. What do you guys think? I think this is a good one. Still touring. You know what? No, I think they're gone. I think they're done. I think they've called it quits. I think they've, they've done their thing. They've, they're doing the family life. Um, that's a pretty good assessment. I think a way to stay in the touring world, at least, is kind of what they're doing with this new acoustic album, which is like just toning it down, but still doing it, not completely throwing in the rag, you know, and saying, hey, we're not going to be jumping on stage like we used to because it's just not realistic. Um, and it doesn't really make sense, you know, but I could see them, you know, toning it down and playing acoustic sets and riding into the sunset. But, you know, it's to be seen. If you haven't seen any other punk bands go that route, I mean, Green Day is still going strong, but they're, an, they're a machine. So, and punk bands before that are extreme legacy, you know, they're, but they're still playing the clubs and clinging on for the old days. Clinging on. That's a good question, though. I think that's a good point, Nate, which is maybe they'll go the acoustic route. The only thing I'll say is, can Jordan hit in that register at 55? I don't know. I mean, maybe, probably. I, I, I think uh, health, family might play a, a part of that. I, I think they'll probably wrap it to be honest with you, before then. Yeah, we might get a like a reunion one-off or something like that. But yeah, I think they'll probably say, you know what? We've gotten everything we, we could have and more out of this band. So, All right, next one here. A little spin on this. What band that's on top right now, that's at the top right now, that will still be on top in 10 years? Define on top. Festival headlining. Okay. Still that band. Because, I mean, Taylor Swift's not going anywhere in the next 10 years, let's be honest. Yeah, that's true. T-Swift, 100%. Yeah. She's still on top in 10 years. I mean, at that point, she's, she won't even be 40, maybe? And especially, she'll be right around there. But especially doing what she does. Like, she can do that till she's 70 if she wants to. I'm not sure she'll resonate the same way when she's that age with... But her fans will stay with her, you know? So, I think she's definitely the one for me. Uh, as far as, like, band headliners or, or bands that are doing that, man, that's tough because... I don't know if there are too many bands that are going to have a... It might be what we have now. It might be some of the bands we have now if they're still doing it because I don't know what else is going to come up and take the, that space that isn't getting the time of day. I know it's, like, it's crazy to start think about, you know, thinking about like what bands are you, are you, do you have in mind. Like Taylor Swift, it's an obvious, yeah, she's still young. Ten years from now, she can still go. There was something I was going to say earlier, like bands that can no longer reach the notes, but using, you know, technological advancements in, <laughs> yes. you know, making the show still happen. You, did you guys see the movie A Star is Born? And he's got like the auto tune. He's like, I don't fucking do auto tune. Like, I'm a rock star. Why would I do that? But ultimately, if you want to keep it going, you have to pivot to those type, types of things. Additionally, bands that are quasi on top, one that comes to mind personally, I guess, is Kings of Leon. Do I think they're going to still do it in 10 years? Yes, because that style of music is conducive to that. So, but the question is, will they still be on top? I think so, based on legacy. And again, the style of music is just conducive. It's, it's, it's timeless. Mm-hmm. A timeless sound It's basically like a rock and roll band, right? Hmm. I think I disagree with you, man. Well, I just keep thinking of the, the headliner shortage. There's just not many, like you said, to come up and replace them. So it's like... Well, that's our maybe, they'll be, maybe they'll be fake. Maybe they'll be AI. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know what I mean? Circle. Like, we're 10 years, 10 years down the road. Maybe there's this, the second artist that they signed to, <laughs> and he's not a racist tr- stereotype. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, maybe we get that. 
I don't know. I'm, I'm spitballing, obviously. Last one. This podcast. <laughs> oh, man. In ten, in 10 years. <sighs> I'd love for that, but I Same. don't know. You just don't know. Too much can happen. Tough to say. Yeah. Yeah. Future is unknown. We got chat GPT on our side, so. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I hope we're still doing it 10 years. I like doing this every week with you guys. Uh, I think we continue to do it. We're only going to continue to to have awesome conversations with people. So I'm going to say yes, but that's just wishful thinking. I'm going to, I'm going to echo that. Nate's saying silent. Nate's like, <laughs> no, nah, bro. Fuck off. No, no. I'm, I'm thinking the same thing because it's, we often like think of this podcast in the lens of like a small garage punk band. That's like, God, dude, if we just keep going, if we get better, if we meet the right people, if we play the right venues, you know, it'll all work out. And, We've seen a lot of progress since inception, so it's kind of like not guaranteed, but the harder you work, the luckier you get, and I think that's applicable to this podcast. It's fair. Yep. We also need to, we, we need somebody to amplify our voices, and this is the same for anybody in our position, whether it be other like-minded or collective, uh, as we talked about with different bands joining together, or you know, getting a little help from from a, a big name player, and and I w- we would love that, obviously. But we continue to grind because we like doing it, and we like listening or talking to each other about different music and finding different people to come in and talk with us. I mean, I have this whole shrine right here next to me that you can't see on camera: Tattoo the Earth beer, a Deftones beer, a Troll sticker, something signed by Clutch, something signed by Corey Taylor. Like, this is all for the pod, baby. I love all this shit. And then the beauty is. We say this a lot, no one's off limits. And that's, for me, that's a massive draw of the podcast. That's a massive, like, you know, even even more than, like, you know, getting big or more listeners. It's like, who's who's around the corner? You know what I mean? That we're going to chat with. Agreed. Uh, we, yeah, didn't, yeah. we didn't think Scott Ian was going to be there. Is Scott Ian walking no through shit, that door? Right, exactly. Scott, well, Peanut from 311. Is Peanut walking through that door? <laughs> well, even beyond that, right? Subjects like this, you know, just collaborating on the what ifs, just always being curious in regards to the music industry. Because there's a lot of podcasts. I mean, I talked about Joe Rogan earlier. He's got everyone on, but we're doing that, but funneling through the lens of music and music appreciation, music industry and evolution and the old, new and weird, you know, and it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Like, I feel like we have a infinite amount of subjects we could just pull from at any given time and so that gives it longevity for that reason alone i mean there was stuff in our group text earlier tonight that we all were like oh yeah that's something i hadn't heard of you know like talking about a band that we've talked about before i didn't realize this about that band every day we learn something new and that's the the nice thing about the three-headed monster that's the nice thing about doing this you know as a as a hobby as a, a fun little extra piece to our uh, our lives that I, I just think is a blast. So yes, 10 years from now, we're going to still be here, baby. Once a week, every every week, you're going to get an episode from the Patio Slate Podcast. What's the P. Diddy or Mace line 10 years from now? We still be on top. Yes, yep. What is <laughs> uh, It's from Mo Money, Mo Problems. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We, uh, we're really excited about 2023 shows, conversations, topics like this. Where do you think the world is going to be in 10 years as far as music goes? I know Chip has thoughts, so I'm, I can't wait to read your email, Chip. But yeah, it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be interesting out there, and we're hoping that uh, we got some of this stuff right and some of it wrong, maybe, too. Uh, let us know what you think. Hit us up. I'll be here. You'll be here. And uh, see you next week. Yeah, if the big dogs take these ideas and put them to use, we want, we want credit. At least just shout out the podcast, let alone pay us. But, you know, no, it is what it is. We want pay money us. if the big yeah, dogs are us. doing it. Yeah. Yep. Pay us. <laughs> Fuck you, pay me. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, bye, dudes. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at PatioSlavePodcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you. Uh, All right. Uh, Yeah, so 149, Nate, you are up. If you're down for it, I'll mute and we can get rolling if you guys are ready. All right, keep doing that. (laughs) I have a pen in my hand, but it's not me.